Well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, and welcome to the adult Sunday school class at Believer's Chapel. We would like to um, welcome any new visitors that we have with us today. I don't see any new faces, but are there any here? If not, then let's open, shall we, in a word of prayer. Our Father, we do uh, thank you and cherish this time that we have to come before you and to open your word. And we thank you for this very rich study that we are going through about the rise of David, a king without a kingdom that Mike has been bringing to us. And for the lessons it teaches us about these two men that had uh, so such a different view of how they wanted to honor the Lord. David did. Saul only wanted to honor himself. So Lord, we pray that this would be a time of uh, good uh, and solid uh, lessons for us and pray that the Lord Jesus would be magnified and that we would uh, be strengthened and encouraged to walk in a way that honors him. For we pray in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Uh, Mike has asked me to read a couple of passages this morning uh, from our lesson uh, that has to bear on our lesson. We're going to begin with uh, 1 Samuel chapter 19. So open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 19, and we're going to look at verses 18 through 24. 18 through 24 in 1 Samuel 19. Now David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed in Naoth. And it was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. But when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. So Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. Then he himself went to Ramah and came as far as the large well that is in Seku. And he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Behold, they are in Naoth in Ramah. And he proceeded there to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also, so that he went along prophesying and continually until he came into Naoth in Ramah. And he also stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied before Samuel, and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Now flip back, if you would, just a few pages. We're going to look at uh, chapter 15, beginning with actually just verses 23b. 1 Samuel 15, 23b. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, this is Samuel speaking to Saul, he has also rejected you from being king. Mike, we look forward to the lesson. I was enjoying those texts so much, I thought, God, those are great texts. Thank you, Warren. Good morning, everyone, and... Uh, Welcome to the adult Sunday school class at Believer's Chapel. We miss Mark. I understand he is back in the Northeast enjoying, I hope, uh, cooler weather. This text this morning looks like uh, it's very simple and straightforward until you begin to look at it and you find it's like an aerial photograph from outer space of the Grand Canyon. And the closer you look at the photograph and the more detailed you get into it, you see there is a lot there. This text this morning covers the hierarchy of Israel the way it is structured and set up by God. It addresses the issue of prophecy in the book of First and Second Samuel. But the most important thing, I think, about the passage itself 
is it is about the will of God for you and for me as we go forward in our lives today. I don't put, uh, I don't put our lessons with names on them. I'm not that gifted. I just list them by number. I believe this is number 16, maybe 17. I would need to check for certain. But if I were to put a title to this lesson, I would call it Crisis, Conflict, and Confrontation. That is what we have. We left off last time David going out the window of his own home. That's verse 12. Michael let David down through the window, and he went and fled and escaped. The term fled and escaped is in most of your translations. It's a key phrase for the next section of David's life. You see it in verse 18. As for David, he fled and escaped. And in chapter 20, and verse 1, and David fled and escaped. David's on the run. He is the man staying in the shadows. Anyone trying to curry favor with the king could tell instantly where he is and probably receive a rich reward. Therefore, David will only go to those who he trusts the most. And that begins our text this morning with verse 18. He comes to Saul at Ramah. Where did he go? He went to the always reliable prophet of God. In a world that only works for what you can do for me, do people find you consistently reliable? Are you always the kind of person that is willing to help if possible? That's where David went. And the scriptures say he informed him of everything that Saul had done to him. Now we've heard nothing of Samuel since that remarkable visit back in chapter 16. No telling how much time has passed between David coming to Samuel and now this interlude where he finds and seeks out the prophet. But him going there is of great importance. Why? Because the living God rules by His Word, not by times or seasons, and not certainly by the rule of men. So the ultimate authority, humanly speaking, rests with the prophet of the Word, not with the king. And here is your text to understand the authority and the hierarchy in Israel. What Warren just read for us, 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That one sentence is much more complex than you first realize. Notice the you is mentioned twice. It's a personal message. Notice the word rejected occurs twice. It is consequences. Notice that the word of the Lord is in a synonymous parallel to the word he, third person singular. The word reject is the outcome, the outcome for Saul. 
He is no longer considered God's king. And yet, in the mind of men and the world that they live in, he still has the trumpets, the flags, and the army. So, this will give us an idea of the organizational chart as God has set it up in Israel. The first box at the top of the page is the Word of God. And the next box down below that is the prophet and the priest of God. In 2 Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 18, Azariah the priest confronted the powerful King Uzziah who was going into the temple to burn incense. The priest confronted him. The king pushed him aside. He went in to burn incense, and as he started, leprosy broke out on his forehead. The prophet and the priest are over the king in the hierarchy of Israel. Then comes the king in his reign. It tells us that all nations are set up under some authority by the way God has set forth His case in His Word. We get some idea of that in Psalm chapter 2 and verse 12 in which David, the greatest of all the kings of the earth, declared that the nations are to kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way. A nation that diverges from the Word of God and the rule of God's Word will ultimately be self-destructive and perish. Now, what about us? We don't rule and reign over nations. We are simply people that live our lives, and we try to follow the Word of God as it is set forth for us in His Word. And as we do that, we will find blessing and peace no matter what the political arrangement is around us in life. Here's the final thought regarding the nations and rule and authority. Uh, 1 Samuel 19 is our text, but from that day forward, 1 Samuel 19, there will be a convergence of these three offices in Israel. The Word of God, the priest or prophet, and the king. They will come together in time. Think of it as a Venn diagram. Three concentric circles that overlap. And in the center where they overlap will come one personality in history. That one individual will occupy all three roles. Prophet, priest, king. How will you know that he's genuine? How will you know how to interpret him and to find him? Here's how. The New Testament will tell you. He will be called the Word of God. He will be identified as the priest of God, and he will be known as the King of God. You find him, he has the ultimate authority over all things, and you are to give him your full and complete allegiance of your life. Now look at the latter part of verse 18. So he said, all that Saul had done to him. The failure of the things of God 
are always about people. We began our study in 1 Samuel 16 with Saul, with Samuel grieving over Saul. If you have a zeal for righteousness and the honor of God's name, human failure should grieve us all and at all times. The book of Proverbs defines us as people of humility and the fear of the Lord. In the New Testament, we are to walk by the Spirit and make no provision for the flesh. We are to seek to serve Him. And how do we do that daily? By counting others better than ourselves in our conduct. Now, David is staying at Naoth. We're not sure exactly where that is. A town, a region near Ramah. What I do want you to see is Saul's attempt to kill David. Verse 19, it was told Saul, David is at Naoth in Ramah. So what does Saul do? Verse 20, he sent messengers to take David. But entering that area, notice, he comes, they come upon what is called elders or company. We're not exactly sure what that phrase represents. Earlier in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 5, Saul encountered a group of prophets in a a company a group, and Samuel was standing in charge of them, holding a position of authority over them. Later, Elijah will be associated with a group. We're not exactly clear what they are doing, but the word that is assigned to us is prophesying. Notice verse 20. 21, 23, and 24. A man that I admire and listen to that teaches the Bible is none other than Dan King Duncan. And in a small gathering, that individual said something I found very profound about the Old Testament. So profound that I wrote it down on a napkin. Now, you may snicker over that, but I want you to know, writing something down on a napkin, I have the full force and authority of Southwest Airlines, who says the best ideas are born on napkins. He said this, that the Old Testament is not like a puzzle. Every piece snaps together, and at the end, you see this big, beautiful picture. He said that there are a lot of rough edges on the pieces, that there are gaps and holes in the picture. At the end, we simply find the Old Testament in places unexplainable and difficult. Here is prophesying. What does it mean? In chapter 10 and verse 5, the word was associated with a group using musical instruments. What's that all about? When Saul met that group, the Scriptures say the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And no more. In 1 Samuel chapter 18, which we did cover, 18.10, there was a harmful spirit that overcame Saul. And the New American Standard translated the word raved. But you know what? It is the same word as prophesy. 
What we want to know is the effect upon the Word. Bruce Walke, in his all-comprehensive Old Testament theology, says it is a break in the psychological structure of a person that they are temporar temporarily arrested. I looked up in Webster's the word trance. The synonyms that were associated with that word are stupor or days. Here's the effect in 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 10. Saul was listening to David play the harp, enjoying the music, and the next minute he's throwing a spear at him to kill him. So what do we understand about the term prophesying? Well, it takes different forms in different contexts altogether. I will discuss it only in the terms of biblical theology. What do I mean by biblical theology? Only as the writer, the historian, or historians of 1st and 2nd Samuel present the word to us. Note the time that the word occurs. Early monarchy. You have non-writing prophets. What we know about what Samuel says is what the historian records that Samuel says. You have no book of Samuel like Isaiah or Jeremiah or Ezekiel. This is history. So time is important. It's very ambiguous. The effect is consistent. It makes you into a different person in some form, in some behavior. Finally, in reading for this study, I, I tried to read very broadly to anyone that had anything to say about the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. I found this very interesting note from John Owen in his work on the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. He said, it is all preparatory for the great work of new creation in the New Testament. Well, that made a lot of sense to me because we certainly understand regeneration, don't we? The Holy Spirit coming down upon us and we are changed. In effect, we become different people. And that's consistent, isn't it? In the, Old Test in the New Testament. Saul is turned to Paul. Peter, afraid of a servant girl and the warmth of a fire, he denies Christ. And yet, this is the same man in a few weeks that will stand on Solomon's portico and preach Christ powerfully to thousands. A different man. We have all been changed in some form or fashion in regeneration. 2 Corinthians 5.17 The apostle says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and everything becomes new. Now, prophecy, I know, is exciting and glamorous, and we want to talk about it forever, but this isn't New Testament prophecy. This falls upon the wicked as well as the righteous. What's really important here in our text is to see how God protected David. And he did it by his invisible hand of power. Notice the latter half of verse 20. The Spirit of God came upon these messengers of Saul. And look at the effect. They were rendered incapable of carrying out the orders. In other words, just as before, they were turned into another man. Verse 21, Saul hears their 
that these men have become virtually worthless to his orders. So what does he do? He sends another troop, but they're rendered the same. And so also a third time with the same effect. Verse 22. Totally frustrated with the incompetence of what Saul now thinks he sees. Well, here's verse 23. Or verse 22. It's... uh, The bad guys are behind the barrels and in the shadows of the town. The Conestoga wagon is loaded with dynamite and somebody has lit the fuse and we hear it going up to this wagon. But don't worry, John Wayne is walking down the street at midnight. Not to worry, Saul's got this. He's going to take this matter into his own hands. And that's what happens. Now I want you to notice, be sensitive to the text of the narrative. It was, the messengers came in three bundles. And it was very tersely explained. They came and they were rendered useless. But now notice how the scriptures slow down. And the Spirit of God came upon Saul too. Verse 24, and the effect, look, he was made just like everyone else. But even more so, look what the text says. Strips, a very important word. He strips off his royal garments. Now he's just an ordinary man. It's the superiority of Samuel over Saul. That's what's happening here. The voice of Elijah the prophet is speaking to us from the Old Testament. 2 Kings 6.16 Do not be afraid. Those who are with us are greater than those who are with them. The Lord Jesus Christ has raised you up for a time such as this. You are to be a living testimony to Him and for Him. And you will have the inevitable confrontations of life because of the way you're living. Paul had them often and always. Live for Christ, you will have confrontations. The will of God goes through David, but the will of God goes through you as well. You ever seen a man stripped naked before your eyes? I did. The day of infamy, December 7th, but my day was 1996. I had questioned the chief executive officer of one of the companies that I was an owner in and the way he was moving money around in the company. For that, I was told to be at his office Saturday morning, December 7th, 1996 at 11 o'clock. I showed up. My wife was in prayer. I had been in much prayer. I knew this was an inevitable confrontation. I sat down and I started the meeting telling him exactly why I thought that he was in error. I finished. He said, you know, if I were standing on the bank of a roaring river and I fell into that river, I think there's only one person 
in all the circle of my friends and associates that would dive in, and that would be you. Okay? And then he began to sob. And he sobbed uncontrollably. He didn't stop. He kept grabbing tissue paper and sobbing. I became so uncomfortable, I just excused myself and left. I went home. I sat down in front of my wife and said, you will not believe what just happened. I have no way of explaining that. This is a man who graduated first in his class in petroleum engineering, the top of his class in law school. Why he could think circles around me, he was gifted resplendently. I said nothing. He wept. Have you ever been in a situation where you say, I didn't do anything. They did it all to themselves. You ever seen somebody unravel in a fit of temper before you? They make great fools of themselves. And you look back on it and you say, how foolish they were. I read this quote from Dabin Ye in the book of Proverbs, uh, in our lessons of Proverbs. It is such a compelling passage, I need to read it again. It's regarding the diet of worms. The Pope had condemned the man Martin Luther, and yet here he stood before a tribunal far superior to a pope in Rome. The pope had put him under a ban, debarring him from all human society. And yet here he is, convened in the most honorable of terms, abetted before the most august assembly of the entire world. The Pope had ordered his mouth shut to be forever mute, and yet he was going to open that mouth before an audience that represented thousands upon thousands. The assembled at Worms, the Emperor Charles V, his brother, the Archduke Ferdinand, six electors of the empire, whose descendants are almost all wearing crowns of kings, 24 dukes, the greater part of them reigning over territories of greater and lesser extent. The Duke of Alva and his two sons, eight margraves, 30 archbishops, seven ambassadors, among them the kings of France and England, the deputies of 10 free towns, a great number of princes, counts, sovereign barons, the nuncio of the Pope. In all, 204 personages of power. And here was Martin Luther. What we all know is that the Diet of Worms had been convened for the purpose of discrediting, humiliating, ruining, arresting, imprisoning, even killing the man. And yet, on the second day of his appearance, which was very brief in both appearances, the first and second day, Martin Luther walked out of that hallowed hall untouched, unscathed. How do you explain that? You don't. You don't. Verse 22. 
He came to the great well at Siku. And there he asked, where are Samuel and David? And one said, wait a minute, wait a minute. One? What one? Which one? Genesis chapter 37. Jacob sends his son Joseph to find his brothers. They were taking their sheep to graze at Shechem. He goes to Shechem, but the brothers aren't there. But the text says, 37.15, one, one says he heard that they had gone on. They had moved to a different location. And he followed that location. And that nameless, faceless man became the integral link to get Joseph down into Egypt. The text here says one. The information this morning comes to you from one. A nameless, faceless person. Because the person is not important. What's important is the message. And here's the message. How'd you get here? I didn't invite you. You are here by the providence of God to hear His Word for you and to you this morning. And here it is. In righteousness, confrontations come. They're unavoidable. Oh, I don't like confrontation. Who does? You've got to be some kind of a sick person to want confrontation. But they come because of your life and your lifestyle and your personal testimony in a world that's going to hell and living in darkness. The powerful king is rendered powerless before the prophet by God's Spirit. And what would Samuel's testimony be? Well, we did, I didn't do anything. That's right. That's the only kind of victory you want. In other words, his violent resolve was over. Verse 24, according to the Scriptures, There is more here regarding Saul. And perhaps your text says also or others. But the text really is focused on Saul, the powerful king, is it not? Verse 24, stripped and fell. Two very important words. As I said, stripped is important. The word naked could or not be completely without clothes. We don't know. The Christian Alfred Edersheim believes it refers to upper garments. S.R. Driver, another scholar, reminds us that men wore under tunics, is what he said. That's not our concern. What is our concern are the garments. Because, you see, the garments are a transfer of office. Numbers chapter 20, verse 25. The Lord is speaking to Aaron and his son Eleazar. And He says, take him up to the mountain of Hor and our word from 1 Samuel 19, strip. Strip Aaron of his garments and put them on Eleazar, his son. There is the new priest. The garments are the transfer of office. When we saw David go into the tent of Saul, 1 Samuel chapter 17, Saul offered his armor. David didn't work with them. David was clothed in the power of God. But 
For Saul to give him his armor was in effect for Saul to give away his rule and his reign. The transfer of garments is the transfer of office. We saw it again. 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 4. Jonathan the Great. Jonathan the Magnificent. Again, our verb. He stripped himself of the robe that he was given, and he gave it to David, and the armor, and the sword, and the bow, and the belt. All those things making David the heir apparent to the king. All by the transfer of garments. That's the first word, stripped. Here's the second one, fell. The significance of the word fell is in the preposition that precedes it before in the inspired language. In other words, Saul fell before power. And here is the way the historian describes it for us. It is the word lifni. Lifni is the designation of regal or signorial authority, political power. Here's the way it's used. Very next chapter. Chapter 20 and verse 1. David asked Jonathan, what is my offense before, there it is, lift me, before your father, your father the king, your father with power. What our historian just did by inserting that word is he's telling us that the real power is not the king. It's with the prophet. I conclude. Verse 24, Saul lays naked some form all day, all night. That's what the Scriptures record. And don't miss this. The people saw it. The common people saw it. And the people say, is Saul among the prophets? Notice they don't mention any of the other cadre of people that went down to arrest Saul, uh, Samuel, and David. Now, this is just one man, the king, before one man, the prophet. Now, notice their question. Is Saul among the prophets? You see, they have no ability to interpret what they're seeing. They just see Saul out there under prophecy, whatever that is. Different context, it means different things. People of the world have no ability to interpret what they see. If you look at the New York Post this morning, there's a picture of Donald Trump with a bullet whizzing past his head. And because that bullet had been in a humid area, it left a trail, a streak to follow. The people say, how lucky. Isn't that amazing? And John Flavel says, he who doesn't look for a providence misses a providence every day. Is Saul among the prophets? No, Saul is not among the prophets. Saul is a wicked, wicked man. This is about the superiority of Samuel. And that's what's important. The will of God goes through David. That's why we're studying his life. But more than that, the will of God goes through you. Goes through me. We are his living representatives today. 
Are you headed for conflict? Do you know it's coming? Walk in the will of God. Walk in the light as He is in the light. They who are with you are greater than they who are with them. So I sat down with my partners after this confrontational meeting in 1996. And they said, tell us. Tell us. I told them. And they looked at me like they had seen a ghost. How do you explain that? You don't. It is the power of God that works His will in and through your life and accomplishes the divine design for which you have been brought into this spiritual life today. The great Charles Spurgeon. I quoted him early in this study and I quote him again. The more resistance that a man or a woman of God experiences, the more certain, said Spurgeon, will their life's purpose be achieved. I stand before you this morning because God won that victory in 1996. David becomes a great king because Saul fell before Samuel that day. And the people, they don't know what's going on. But you and I do. There is a reason. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 for the Apostle Paul to say to us, I do not want you to be ignorant. And we're not. We live and move and have our being in Him. In the providence of God. And He determines the outcomes. For as David said, the battle is the Lord's. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for our time of study this morning. Bless Believer's Chapel. Bless the people who attend the Word of God here. Bless their families. Guide, guard, direct them, and fortify them to know that they are yours. And because they are yours, they are made powerful in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.